Firstly, I'd like to just start out with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all your wonderful, wonderful blessings. We have truly been blessed by you in so many different ways. Help us to be servants out of love for you. Thank you for your grace and love and just guide us in our lives. And please help me today. Help me as I speak. I want these to be your words, not mine. And help me uplift you, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, I would like to tell you a story. Two stories, actually, about two armies. But first I would like to just give a little background. I'm going to be talking about two military armies in a worldly manner, but I want you guys to interpret this in a spiritual aspect. As you know, the only common ground between Christ and Satan is this world, the battleground. And we happen to live in this battleground. And so, therefore, we as Christians, we serve God, and we are his foot soldiers. And we have a great job to do. However, because God is with us and his grace and mercy, we can accomplish great things as his foot soldiers, not in our own power, but in his. So here's, here's a story. I think this is really interesting. There's one army. And as you know, armies today in, the, in, the, in our world, they're very complex. They have all this machinery and all these different maneuvers and there's all these different foot soldiers and they coordinate these exercises and execute these different movements and all these different moving parts and everybody knows their part and it takes them a long time and there's a lot of powerful minds that build these plans to go to battle so all these foot soldiers they get their plans they know where they're supposed to be well, so Army A, I'm going to call this Army A, they give all these soldiers their directive. They know exactly where they're supposed to be, each and every one of them, every moment. And they're going to meet up with this battalion at this point. And then they're going to do this. And then they're going to do that. And Army A gave each and every one of their foot soldiers very detailed plans. They all knew exactly where they're supposed to be, when, and when they're meet up, so forth. But what happens when the battle starts? Does the enemy have a vote in how the plans go? There's this old saying in the military, plans go out the window when you make contact with the enemy. Because all of a sudden, Everything changes. Oh, this didn't happen because of the weather. And this didn't happen because this equipment was busted down un unexpectedly. So all of a sudden in Army A, they did not give them any other directive except their precision detail plans. So when they got to the bridge where they're supposed to meet battali the, the battalion they're supposed to meet, and it didn't happen, they had no idea what they were supposed to do. They literally were like, what do we do next? So plan Army B trained their soldiers a little differently. They said, yes, we're going to give you all these detailed plans, but there's something else that we want to be more important than these detailed plans. And that is something we're going to call the commander's intent. If you guys know what the commander's intent is, and that's your number one focus. Guess what happens when the weather destroys one of the tanks or, or whatever happens and something, something doesn't happen as according to detail? You guys can improvise on your own. So what happens is this has become the most important focal point in today's armies is commander's intent. Therefore, they rely on individuals to make decisions when things don't go exactly right. We, as foot, foot soldiers for Christ, 
we should know what our commander's intent is. Without that, we can have a lot of activity and we can have a lot of detailed plans with specifics and go through a lot of motions. But if we don't really focus on commander's intent, we may not be able to accomplish much. And the reason being is, is our enemy is going to throw monkey wrenches into our plans. So what I was thinking is, what would be our commander's intent? And I would like some feedback on that. What would you think if we could sum up, first of all, who's our commander? God, Christ, exactly. What would you say his simplistic commander's intent is? Spread the gospel would be one, yes, very basic. They're all very, there's several of them. You can go through the Bible and find them. And this is really what I think is so key is as Christians today, we need to truly know the CI or commander's intent. And I've gone through the Bible and just, I picked out a few passages that to me are like, oh wow, this is one of our, my commander's intent. There's a lot of different things going on. In, in our religion, we can sometimes make it fairly complex. But you know what? We can never lose focus of what our commander's intent is. And here's some passages that come to my mind. Number one, Colossians 3.14. If you want to open your Bibles, you can look at that with me. This is a pretty amazing passage to me because I think it highlights one thing about Christ's life when he was here with us on earth. If you notice, one thing that Christ always did was do things that didn't make sense to the people around him. His apostles and disciples, half the time they were like, don't do that, Christ, or why are you doing that? Or why are you talking to that woman? Or why didn't you treat that political and religious leader with a little more respect? We could sure use this, his influence. Christ was very simplistic. But one of his thrusts that was very consistent in his life is love. He treated people with love. Every single person he came in contact with, regardless if they were Pharisees or prostitutes and everything in between, he treated with love and he saw a child of God in need of a Savior. And he approached them that way and pursued them. By the way, he's pursuing us the exact same way. By the way, each and every one of us are equally in need of a Savior. Fortunately, I think we being here as Christians, we realize that. There's a lot of people in our world that may not even realize it. I know in my own life, there was a time that I was like, what? I need a Savior? I'm a sinner? What, what are you talking about? However, through the grace of God and a lot of different things, I came to realize I was in desperate need of a Savior. So let's just read Colossians 3.14. Here's, here's the passage. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Now put on charity. What is charity? Charity is really love. It's treating each other with a tremendous amount of respect. It's, it's really making sure that every interaction we have with people, we're treating them as a true brother and sister. We all have challenges. Yet, God is saying right here, above all these things, put on charity. So this to me is one of my commander's intents. He's telling me, Andy, when you go out and about, you know what, you may be having a bad day. Well, a lot of people are having a bad day. But one thing you can do is put on charity, and make sure that I treat people. I glorify you, God, is what, I, what God wants me to do, is glorify him in the way I actually interact with everybody around me, in my business, in just walking down the street, whatever. Now, charity is a real interesting word to me if you look at it and if you study it, but ultimately it basically means having compassion and just looking at people in a light of like, wow, how can I help? 
Now, something interesting about love and charity is love and charity is spawned or created by an act of love. And it's not like you use it up. It's like a smile. Like if I smile at Susan, she's going to smile back. We've created two smiles right there. Where did those smiles come from? They come from creating a smile. And it's this is where I think God gives us the power to love others. More love comes about of this. And the more you love others, the more there is love. So you never use it up. The only way you can create more is do more. So it's really a wonderful thing. Let's look at another passage, John 21, 17. And this is directly from Jesus' words. And this is when Jesus was talking to Peter. And Peter had had a very traumatic situation where he had denied his Savior three times. And unbeknownst to, to Peter, remember before that, Peter was talking about, I think he made the comment something like this. These people, and he's pointing to the other disciples, they may forsake you, Christ, but I never will. And Christ, knowing more about Peter than Peter knew of himself, just like Christ knows more about each and every one of us than we know about ourselves, says, Peter, you're about to deny me three times. And Peter, I'm sure, thought, there's no way I'll die before I do that. Well, it happened. And all of a sudden, this is Peter's time back with Christ, and it's a time, and Peter has been converted at this point, big time, because he realized his weakness. He realized how much in need of Christ he truly was. And that is a wonderful thing. And by God's grace, we need to totally realize our dependence upon our Savior. Sometimes we can live parts of our lives or in phases of our lives where we just don't think we need God right now. Everything's going good. I've got it under control. That's just not reality. And the older you get, the more you realize that. Or at least it is with me. But here Peter is, he's able to speak with his Savior again. And this time he is a different person. He's extremely humble. And God asked him, Jesus asked him, do you love me? And he asked him three times. And Peter had to answer that three times. And I think there's significance to the three because Peter denied him three times. And even the last time Christ asked Peter, do you love me? Peter was like, I'm sure he was just head was down and says, God, you, Jesus, you know all things. You know I love you. And here is, to me, a fantastic and very informative, some very informative words from Jesus. He says, okay, you know, I know you do, Peter. And he gives him a commission. He says, tend my sheep or feed my sheep or take care of my sheep. Oh, wow. So this is interesting. So this is, this is what he's giving Peter, his, the commander's intent. He didn't give him a tremendous amount of detail plans. Okay, Peter, you love me. Great. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to this church, and I want you to go to this town and start a church here and do this and do that. He basically said, Peter, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. And basically he was saying, Peter, I want you to be salt of the world, salt of the earth. I want you to go out and be a light. You're going to encounter things every single day that you're going to have to use your own little brain to think. Of course, God gives us a brain, and he gives us biblical principles that we can make these decisions. We need to always be praying for guidance to the Holy Spirit, by all means. But you know what? I don't know if you guys are like me, but sometimes I'm wishing that God would just give me a list and say, Andy, here's all the decisions you need to make. Here's, here, you know, Even on the way to work, should you drive this way or that way? Well, God doesn't do that. He basically gives us biblical knowledge and principle and love, and he wants to guide us in very specific things in, at specific times. But there's a lot of gray areas. Now, if it's black and white, it's black and white. But if it's gray and it's maybe not a sin issue, God wants us to utilize our minds that he gave us, these wonderful minds. How do we do that? Well, I feel like we really need to know our commander's intent. We need to know what Jesus Christ's main thrust is in his life. We can study his life. But also, 
what is his main focus for our lives? Well, we just talked about one in Colossians 3, 4. So let's talk about this second one. John 21, 17. Feed my sheep. It's very similar. Go out. Interact. When you run across people, you help. You guide. You give. And sometimes it's, you may just be an ear for them. Sometimes, but he wants us to have compassion. He wants us to feed his sheep. He wants us to be tenders, keepers of, keepers of our brothers and sisters. So that's the second commission, or I would call it commander's intent. Now, the Bible is absolutely full of these. Proverbs is full of them. Psalms, all through the Bible, all the stories, there's jillions of them. But they're very common, they're very simple, and they all dovetail into one another. And this is... This should be music to our ears because God is giving us basic principles to live by. Again, we're foot soldiers out in this army. Things are going to go crazy. Satan is going to upset our detailed plans. However, if we know our commander's intent, we know what needs to happen. So let's look at a third one. And again, I'm sure you guys are thinking in your own mind of scriptures you've read, that, yeah, this fits, this would be a great one, this would be a great one. Again, there's, I'm sure, hundreds of them all through the Bible. But this is another one of my favorite ones. It's in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. And again, this is directly from Jesus. And as you recall, this is when the lawyer was asking Jesus, they were questioning Jesus. Probably not for the most noble intentions. I think they were trying to trap Christ at this time, Pharisees and lawyers. And right after this, or actually right at the same time, Jesus told a parable, a story, and it was the prodigal son story. Or actually, excuse me, excuse me. It was the... Uh, Good Samaritan. I'm sorry, I'm getting my Good Samaritan story. But here's what Christ basically said to, to this lawyer. He says, You shall have, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and second, like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wow, that right there is a fantastic, very simple concentrated what I would call commander's intent. This is These are building blocks that we can live our lives on. He's saying, hey, number one, have that relationship with your creator, with, with me, as Jesus is saying this. This is going to empower us. It's going to break the bonds that are limiting us right now or paralyzing us from being effective foot soldiers for Christ. We feel forgiven. We experience God's grace. And all of a sudden, guess what we're able to do when we've experienced God's grace? Number one, it empowers us to break the chains that keep us down with addictions, with all kinds of issues in life, in our lives. But secondly, it allows us to forgive our neighbor. It allows us to look at our neighbor in a very different light. Instead of we looking at them as like, oh, it's me against him. It's like, no, that's my brother. And he may not know our Savior. I've experienced this. I need to share it. I am sitting here feasting. I need to take this and let other people feast on it. Matter of fact, there's a great Old Testament Bible story. Remember the lepers outside the, the wall? And the army vacated and all of a sudden they're feasting on all of the food and inside the wall is the city that's starving. And they're, they're feasting and one of them finally says, hey, we need to do something with this. We need to share it. And they're like, you're right. we got people absolutely starving inside there. We need to go share it. Well, that's us. We need to take this wonderful gospel message, this liberating information, this liberating connection with our, our Savior. And we know people out there struggling. We're, we are struggling. 
And guess what? The struggles never go away, even when we are fighting under the banner of our Creator. It's just the world we live in. We live in a battleground. However, we can have the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives at all times. All of them. God does want us to have each and every one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And among those is peace and joy and love. And really, that's what, that's what we really want in our lives anyway. So we can have that, and we need to feast on it, appreciate it, and share it, and go out. So I was just going to ask, does anybody have that came to your mind a, a bit of scripture that would kind of fit into this? Maybe somebody has one that just popped up in their mind. I'd love to hear it if anybody has one. Anybody? If you don't, that's fine. There's jillions of them out there, and I know you're running across them in your mind and as you read. So here's what I would like to do. I would like us, and this is for me, I'm praying this for myself, but also for everybody else out here and the other churches. We live in a, a, a battleground. We are challenged on a daily basis. Yet, if we can grab some of these really gold nuggets of Christ's intent for our lives and hang on those and really make this the focus of our lives, yes, we need details. Yes, we should learn a tremendous amount about God, about Bible, about doctrines, of all this. This is wonderful knowledge. However, we need to first and foremost keep in the front of our minds and remember that all these other details, they actually only have meaning in the context of having that saving relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The doctrines that we have, the, all this wonderful biblical knowledge, really comes to life only after we truly have that relationship and we truly understand the core intent of our God. So my prayer is for myself to never let out of my forefront of my mind what God's love is all about and help me to be an avenue or a conduit for God's light and love. So I'm going to end with a word of prayer. And again, my prayer is that we each, we each have tremendous responsibilities. And God will guide us. And he will show us what needs to be done. And we can accomplish incredible things through God's power, not our own. The Bible is full of stories like that. So hopefully we can just totally serve God and glorify Him, keeping in mind these core objectives. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all your blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Help us to be godly, humble people. Help us to truly understand the really, truly important things that need to happen in our lives for us to glorify you. And number one is just to be kind, loving people and to truly put on charity above all other things and let everything else find its proper place after we have that truly broken-hearted relationship with our Savior and Creator, Jesus Christ. Amen.